when the thought of God disturbs me. Now the title sounds almost diabolical and even confusing, but these words were said by the psalmist David. Listen to David's cry and confusion at a real pivotal moment of his life, really a crossroad of his life. David says these words in Psalm 77, verse 3. He says, when I remember God, think about this, this is David now. When I remember God, I am disturbed. I am disturbed. The King James says, I'm I'm troubled. When I think of God, I begin to get troubled inside of him. I, I truly believe that every one of us begins to face those times because of even our walk with God and even our belief in God. We have to keep in mind it doesn't always exempt us from those feelings of even feeling that we've been abandoned by God. I love the Psalms because they are human. They're raw. They hold nothing back on praise and they hold nothing back on even pain and confusion. And the writer is up and he's down. But I love the Psalms because the writing is real. Folks, I just have to tell you, I don't have much in me for fake people. I just really don't. I I really kind of believe what Spurgeon said, the great 19th century preacher, when he says this. He said, I don't believe there's ever been a Christian that existed who did not now and then doubt his interest in Jesus. I think when a man says, I never doubt, it's quite now the time is to doubt him. Because I believe that all of us go through that moment. Can this be true, what David is saying? Can this be true? When I think of God, a disturbance comes? Maybe, maybe the translation is off. Maybe that's not exactly what he said. And it's, but what's scary is, is David is really sharing where he's at spiritually, of where, what's going on inside of his heart. And, and, and I have to tell you, when I think about this, I have felt that way at times. It seems like at verse 1, when you start to read the Psalms, David is calling and not even hearing an answer. The great Christian C.S. Lewis wrote it something like this. He says, Sometimes I pray and I wonder if I'm, when I'm praying, I'm posting letters to a non-existent address sometimes. And that's what David was feeling in Psalm 77. That, that you started to feel it to yourself that, God, where are you? Where are you in all this? I was reading on when C.S. Lewis is going through really the trial of his life. His wife, Joy Davidman, was facing cancer married her knowing that there was an ailment in her. She was coming to the end of her life and Lewis, C.S. Lewis started writing a journal called The Problem of Pain, never meant for it to be published. And it was just his private thoughts between him and God, what it was like to go through feeling at times abandoned. Maybe what, like David was saying, the, the, the issue of I'm disturbed, God, I'm crying out to you and I don't feel like you're answering it. In fact, he wrote in there, he said, I wish I had a screaming room just to scream at times. And really, that's what Psalm 77 is. It's David's screaming room. But listen to C.S. Lewis as he began to unburden his struggles when his wife was facing cancer and he was facing his disturbance. Listen to his words. He wrote this, not that I'm in danger of ceasing to believe in God, but the real danger is coming to believe such dreadful things things about him. Look at this, folks. The conclusion I dread is not, so there is no God. What I'm afraid of is this, that God, this is what you're really like. Think of that. Think how real that is. I spent over a year with a dear friend ministering to him when he tragically, he was a pastor who tragically lost his wife. And I would hear him say, I would hear him say over the phone to me, he would go, Pastor Tim, I am so angry. And then he would say these words, God is so mean. Those were his words. That's what he would say. Think of this for a moment. David, like C.S. Lewis, like this pastor, was losing it. The thought of God was not comforting to him, but it was even disturbing. And those words are so challenging. You know what? It's interesting. That word there that's used in Psalm 77, 3, that word disturbing, it's this, it, the, the Hebrew word is this deep groan, or it, it even uses this word growl inside of you. I, when we grew up, one of our kids had a problem growling. 
when you would do, say something to them that they didn't like, they would growl inside of them. And we just said, there is no growling in this house. And, but, I, but, but that's the word that's being used here. Like, think about this. That while people are praising God, saying, so, I'm sold out, no room, no vacancies, I'm all filled up, there are some here sighing and groaning. There are some here with that moment, like that screaming room that David is even facing. I, I saw me in the psalm. I think you're going to see you in the psalm. Because for me, the groaning and the growl sometimes, this is what it usually gets me, is gets me in the waiting season. When I'm waiting for God to do something, it seems that the groaning and the growl starts to rise up inside of me. I, I won I don't like to wait for people when they're late. I don't know if I'm the only one for that. And number two, I don't like to make people wait. But the worst for me is, is I hate it when God makes me wait. That's the part. The groan and the growl starts to come. Our friend, our, 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 one of our favorite speakers here on Tuesday nights, Dr. R.T. Kendall said it like this. There is this long tradition, R.T. said, there's this long tradition that those who are used the most by God usually waited the longest. How many can say that's true? <laughs> usually those that God wants to use usually wait the longest. There is this book I was reading not too long ago, and the author said that some of his friends are a trapeze artist called the Flying Rodleys. And this is what he said. He said, there is this special relationship, get this now, between the flyer and the catcher. Listen to this. He said, when the flyer is swinging and the moment when he lets go of the bar and he's arcing in the air, he says, those seconds he has to wait for the catcher to snatch him. Listen to what he said. I want you to read this. Listen to this. He said, the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. He says the flyer has to wait in absolute trust that the catcher will wait, will, will catch him, but he has to wait. You ready for this? In midair. He says you can't try to grab him. You have to wait for him to grab you. And folks, can I just tell you, there's a lot of you sitting here today that you're in the position that you're waiting for God to grab hold of you right now. And here's the promise. We have a God that will grab hold of you today. We have a God that will grab hold of you today. But it's while we're in midair that we go through the groan and the growl. It's while we're waiting, we're going, God, where are you? I let go. I let go and became a Christian. I let go and began to tithe. I let go and I began to tell my family about Jesus. I let go and I, and I, and I began to be obedient to what you've asked me to do. And some of us are waiting for him to catch us. And I'm telling you today, you're going to have confidence today that God is going to catch you. Those watching in Belize, those watching in Spain and the Netherlands and South Africa, God is going to catch you today. Because some of us are in that vulnerable moment that we've let go, and sometimes we don't feel the hand of God upon us. But really the challenge is, can we trust the catcher? Or can we trust God here today? It's in that moment, while we let go and are waiting for God, it's in that moment that the crazy thoughts begin to come in. And some of us are afraid to let go. And what we define out in our Christian life, we're just swinging back and forth, doing the same thing over and over again. And God's going, just let go, let go. And there is that moment. I've done it. I've, I've, I've had to work through that growl and that groan. I had to work through that disturbance in my soul. I, I remember vividly going on, a, on the F train and just in my soul, growling and groaning, where are you? Where are you, God? Where are you? And this, there is this rare view in Psalm 77 that I want to walk you through today. It's felt so strong in my heart that I want to walk you through how David began to process through with God this mental anguish, this moment when he's let go and he's wondering, where's the catcher? Where's the one that's supposed to be there? Why, why is this deep groan inside of my spirit. You know, I was sharing with some of the elders before we, before service today, where in Ephesians 6, where the armor of God is, there's one part 
That is very interesting to me in the armor of God. Listen to Ephesians 6.16 as he's wrapping up the armor of God. He says, in addition to all, he says, take up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish, here it comes, the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, what they used to do, the, the image in David's mind was that Roman soldier dipping an arrow in some pitch, very flammable, and before he was about to shoot it, he would begin to light that pitch up, shoot it, and when it would hit, it would splatter and spread is what the whole intention of shooting the flaming arrow was. That's exactly what he's saying. You know what the, you know what the apostle Paul is telling us? That the enemy, his goal is to shoot that flaming arrow, to set it and to put everything in your life on fire. To literally begin, not just even to hit, to, to, to just hit a target, but to hit your face that all of a sudden, now it starts to spread and every area starts to get questioned. Every area. It's like the flaming arrow hit and spread. The pitch hit. And now every part of your faith is going, where are you? I thought you told me to let go. I thought you were going to catch me. I thought you were going to be here. And then all of a sudden, the groan and the growl goes on deep inside of our spirit. And like David, that flaming arrow hit and stuck. And then all of a sudden, the faith is on fire. His faith begins to get on fire. And here, I want you to see what David begins to do. And I want you to count them with me as we begin to look at Psalm 77, verse seven, because David begins then to see, you start to see where the flame started to spread out. Listen to these five questions of what David is asking, because the flaming arrow hit and spread. And this is what he says after the, this groan and growl. He said, will the Lord reject forever? Question number one. Will he never be favorable again? Question number two. Has his loving kindness even ceased? Question number three. Has his promise come to an end? Question four. Has God forgotten to be gracious or in his anger has withdrawn his compassion? Folks, that's a flaming arrow challenging his face. That's a spot that all of a sudden he's going, here's David who can cry out to the Lord, who can write Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And then all of a sudden, a flaming arrow comes, hanging in midair like that flyer. And you're going, God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And all of a sudden, the questions start to come on his character, his favor, his loving kindness, his promises, his compassion. And let me read to you what David's conclusion was. Here was his conclusion. Then, after all these questions, I said this, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. Look at, look at his conclusion. The most high has changed. You know what I've really learned? When we are really going through it, we really say some dumb things. Anybody with me on that? I've said some dumb things about God, and God is so merciful. God is so merciful going, he doesn't mean that. When we are upset, this is David saying, God is shit. Well, it's impossible. This is the wrong time to establish, David, what God is like. You're under attack. You're in midair. And so this is not the time. I love the way that the message version begins to take that verse 10. Listen to what the message says. Just my luck, I said. The high God goes out of business just the moment I need him. That's fantastic. And that's what I felt at times. I have felt like that. But here's what I started to realize. When you don't know what to do with your big questions, you'll end up with the wrong conclusions. Let me say that again. When you don't know what to do with your big questions, you're going to end up with the wrong conclusions. And so I want to help you work through that. Those that are watching on, those in person, in the balcony, on the main floor, I want to walk you through some of that. So what does David do with the groan, the growl, the disturbance inside of him? What does David do with when his world is on fire and the flame is hitting every area of your life? When I was walking in today, one of our precious volunteers began just to say, just pray for me, Pastor Tim. Just pray for me. And just walk me through. She said, I just need one minute. Walk me through some of the areas that the enemy has just put on fire and just saw the flame begin to spread. And we just prayed right there. And here's what I started to realize. Elizabeth Elliot said it best. She said this, faith does not eliminate questions, but faith knows where to take them. 
And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take those questions. We're not afraid of questions. We're not afraid of faith beginning to face the flaming arrows. So how do you fix the groan and the growl sometimes? How do you fix the sigh that's in your spirit? How does that get fixed? You ready? Here it comes. Jot this down. Here it is. You go backwards to move forwards out of this funk. I can't believe I put funk on the screen in church. What has happened to me? I should have just said, in, in my mind, that's right. But sometimes it's that crazy. But in order to move forward, you've got to go backwards sometimes. And here it comes. It's these three words that David begins to move forward in. Here it comes. He says these words, I shall remember. Listen to what he says. Verse 11, after he comes to his conclusion, God has changed. And then all of a sudden, something starts in him. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on your work. I'm going to muse on your deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. And what God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You've made me known your strength among the peoples. And you have by your power, hallelujah, you've redeemed your people. Something clicked in David that what he was saying was this. You fight your questions about God with your memory of God and the things that he has done inside of your life. That when the questions come up, you be able to take your great is your faithfulness back weeks, months, and even years ago and say, listen, I know the flaming fire on my faith is happening. Questions have come, but I have to say, when I go backwards, I realize God is in control. He brought me out here. He can bring me out again. He did this before, and he's going to take me out of this again. Memory begins to give you declarations to fight and to fight through. Hallelujah. Listen, the, the most decorated Olympian of all time is Michael Phelps, the swimmer. 28 medals. Nobody has even come close to that. And of those medals, 23 of them are gold medals. It, it's, it's, it's a feat that is just incredible. And he owns uh, the, these records and these world records. But my favorite and the one that he talks about was one of the ones that means the most to him of all those gold medals was the one in Beijing when he's swimming the final of the 200 butterfly. It says when he jumped in on the final, he knew something was wrong. Something happened to his goggles and they started to fill up with water. And as he's trying to swim 200 meters, which is 50, 50, 50, 50, four, he's going to have to have three big turns, turn one, turn two, turn three, and get back. And he said, by the first turn, he couldn't see anything at that point. He says, and all of a sudden, he kicked into memory because his coach at University of Michigan taught him that when he was practicing, his coach would poke in without Michael Phelps knowing it, he would put pinholes in his goggles so that when he would jump in, he would learn to swim through when he couldn't see anything. He would begin to do things to him. He would turn the lights off in the aquatic center and make him swim in the dark, make him swim with water in there. And he said, when I hit the first turn, he said, my memory went on. He said, I knew it took 21 strokes of the butterfly to get me to the wall. He said, when I got to 19, I knew there was two more to go. When I got to 21, I knew do my flip turn and get back. And when the whole race was over, he looked up at the scoreboard. It didn't just say number one. It said world record because he knew in the midst of what was going on. Folks, that's how you do it. When all of a sudden the world starts getting hazy and you can't see God, there's a memory that comes that says, press through, swim through, run through. God will come through. Hallelujah. That was it. That's what God was telling David. God, all of a sudden, the goggles got a hole filled up with water and he started to realize, God's got this. Just when I couldn't see tomorrow, all of a sudden I kicked into memory. 21 strokes make the turn. And some of you are sitting here today going, where's God? I'm telling you, go backwards in order to go forwards. 
Go backwards and let God begin to say, I was faithful there. I'll be faithful tomorrow. You replace questions with mem- remembrance. Remembrance, like David, turns into declarations. And with declarations, you can face mystery. You can face an uncertain future. See, here's what I've learned when, when the goggles get filled. You don't need all your questions answered to move on with God. Let me say that again. You don't need all the questions answered to move on with God. You need to remember that God has always been there and God has always been faithful. See, that's why what's amazing is then at the very end, with David's goggles filled with water, moving on memory of what God has done, he was able to say, I can work even when I, I can continue to press on, even when I don't see God. Look, look at the last verse of this chapter. He says this. He goes, God, your way was in the sea, and your paths are in the mighty waters, and your fr- footprints may not even be known. He said, I can trust you when I can't even see your footprints. You know what it's like to put your footprints in the ocean and pull them out? You can't see them. There's nothing there. You can't even look. And he says, God, I got it. It's okay. I'm remembering what you have done. I was reading the story of Gladys Allward, one of the great missionaries to China in the early 1900s, who was forced to flee when Japan was beginning to invade Yang Chang in the area where she lived. And she was responsible for a hundred orphans as, as literally the armies were pressing in. She goes, how am I going to rescue? I'm just a single lady and I've got to rescue a hundred orphans. Almost sounds like what's happening in the Ukraine today. And for those that are watching or we have watching this week from the Ukraine, this is a word for you. This is a word for you that may be right in the heart of watching in Moscow or watching in Siberia and watching right there, maybe in Ukraine and Kiev or on the borders. And maybe you're moving and someone sent you the link and you're watching on a phone. I'm telling you, and you're thinking, I can't see where to go. And I'm telling you that use the memory of what God has done in the past to bring you forward. And Gladys said, as I finally sat there with a hundred orphans and a mountain in front of me, that I needed to get over to safety with a hundred children. And I'm sitting there, a single woman, a war is coming this way. There's a mountain this way. I've got a hundred children. What am I supposed to do? And she said, during, during that moment, she froze like paralysis. The flaming arrow came and spread. And she goes, I don't even know if I'm going to do this. This great woman of God. And she said, the way I move forward is by a little 13 year old girl. This little 13-year-old orphan came up to her, looked at her and said, Miss Gladys, she said, remember the story of Moses and how God led them through the desert. And then Gladys looked at that little girl and she says, but I'm not Moses. And the little girl said, no, you're not, but God is still God. That's how that works. And with that, a hundred orphans went over that mountain. Because God is still God. That's why when Lewis was coming out of that whole cancer journey with his wife, he said this. He says, I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. He says, because you yourself are the answer. Before your face, before your face questions die away, he said, what other answer would suffice? He said, you have become the answer for me. We have this arrogant thought that God answers all of our questions and it really doesn't happen. Let me finish with this today because this is, because let me just take you to the New Testament today of of what I want to call an exclamation point man whose exclamation points begin to turn into question marks. His name is John the Baptist. His life was known from the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And in fact, in my Bible, twice, When Jesus walks on the scene, he screams out with exclamation point. It says it has it in my Bible, exclamation points. You know the verse. It's John 1, 29. He said when he saw Jesus coming, he said, you know this, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look at the end of that word world. There's a big old exclamation point there. That's in the Bible. Screaming it. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the, the sins of the world. 
Then later on in that chapter, he does it again. Mr. Exclamation Point. He said he looked at Jesus as he came towards him. and He said, behold, the Lamb of God. Here's what's amazing. Remember, real Christians will face real doubts. Real Christians are going to get hit with flaming arrows. It's going to hit and spread. And all of a sudden, John the Baptist, Mr. Exclamation Point, gets an arrow. Listen to Matthew chapter 11. Now, when John, in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said, Are, this is John, this is Mr. Exclamation Point now. Are you the expected one? Or should we look to someone else? I'm going, John, no. You just shouted for the Lamb of God. Now you're wondering if he's the expected one or you should be looking for someone. Here's the question. Leave that verse up there for just a second. What happened to the exclamation points? What happened to this? I'm going to tell you where it all turned. It turned on two huge words. Here it is, church. Here they come. Well, well, when John, here it is, in prison. That will make you question God right there. In prison. That changed everything. All of a sudden, his exclamation points, you ready for this? Just got punched in the gut, and the exclamation point just doubled over into a question mark. That's what happened. Lamb of God, put him in prison. Who are you? That's what goes on. Because all of a sudden, the question mark is punched in the gut. Here's what's crazy. And we need to remember, like David in Psalm 77, we can change, but God doesn't change. Things change, God doesn't change. Life changes, God doesn't change. If Jesus was the Lamb of God two years earlier, prison doesn't change him from being the Lamb of God. He's still the Lamb of God. Our circumstances doesn't make God any different. Let me just say this. John let in prison decide his definition of Jesus. Don't let stuff define who God is. Don't let your present situation go backwards and realize what God has done in your life. Because some of you are sitting here, you're in prison is maybe this. I'm in trouble or I'm in debt or I'm in a divorce or I'm in a wheelchair or I'm in court this week or I'm in rehab. Some of you are going, I'm in hot water. I'm in therapy. Maybe this one, I'm incarcerated. Let me just say that. I don't care what your in is, but let me just say this. There's one in that's stronger. Here it is. You're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, it doesn't matter where that puts you. God is God and he's got you. Let him catch you today. I love Jesus' response to John. He goes, go ask him if he's this expected one. Jesus is amazing. Amazing. Let me tell you what he does. He's, he's going he's gonna to push him back. In order to go forward, John, you got to go backwards. Here he comes. Jesus answered and said, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to him. John, if you want to deal with your questions, let's go back and see what God is already doing. And then the thing, and some of you need to hear this today. And then the part that made me emotional listening to Jesus do this. And then right after that, Jesus begins to look at the people and say this. And I'm going to tell you how significant these words are. Verse 10 says, this is the one. He's talking about John the Baptist. This is the one about whom it is written. I've sent my messenger ahead of you. He's going to prepare the way. That's it. John was fulfilling a prophecy. Listen to this. And truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. That's emotional to me. You want to know why that 
that catches my heart and my soul. John is in the worst condition he has ever been. And Jesus says that this condition you're in of questioning me, though you're questioning me, John, I still love you and think the best of you. Jesus is saying your most difficult moment that you're talking about me doesn't change me. Just because you doubt me, I don't doubt you. Remember this, folks. Listen, remember this. Even in your worst state, you are still dearest to God. Here's John the Baptist going, are you the expectant? Listen, if I was Jesus, I'd be going like, bro, seriously, what are you talking about? You've been with me for two years. Not Jesus. He literally says, John, Jesus gives John the highest statement after John gave the lowest statement about Jesus. Are you the expected one? And Jesus goes, there's nobody greater than John. That's not, I would have said there's no one greater than John after he called me the Lamb of God with the exclamation point. I would never say it after a question mark. Isn't that amazing? While you're sitting here today going, I don't even know if God loves me. God goes, I love you and I wanna change you today. God speaks his greatest things about us when we're in our worst condition. That's how amazing God is. While some of you feel like your whole faith world is on fire, the enemy, the enemy soaked it in pitch and shot it at you and you feel your faith is on fire and questions are going, God goes, I got you on this. I got you on this. There is a tribe in South America that has an initiation rite. We would call it in Judaism, we would call it like their bar mitzvah. For their young men that when they turn 12 years old one of the things that they do is they take their 12 year old children the father leads their 12 year old children into the deepest part of the amazon jungle and he's supposed to stay there all night by themselves all night the father would lead lead them and leave them for their dreaded night to be alone the initiation right to be part of this tribe the boy would sit in fear all night listening to the ghoulish sounds of the jungle. And when the f sun was reading about this, when the sun finally rose the next morning, the boy never would sleep. And he would look just a few feet away. His father was sitting, a tree, just a few feet from him. And the boy asked, have you been there all night? He said, of course, where would you think? Do you actually think I'd leave you there all by yourself? Even though you didn't see me, I was there the whole night for you. John doesn't see Jesus. Jesus is right there. David doesn't see Jesus. Jesus is right there. Some of you are sitting here today, goggles are all full of water. And you're going, I don't know what to do. I'm telling you, he's there. He's there. Spain, he's there. Georgia, he's there. Virgin Islands, he's there. Belize, he's there. Indonesia, Swaziland, he's there. He's there for you. South Africa, Jesus is there for you. Nigeria, he's there. At your worst, God thinks the best about you. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. And that can happen today. That can happen today. Some of you thought he was distant and he's been there the whole time. You being here, you watching online, you being here in person on 51st and Broadway, or you somehow realizing that I'm going to watch this earth. I'm telling you in the midst of the groan, the growl, the disturbance, the, the, the flaming, the, the fire questions, the soul that is on fire from the questions, all of that stuff, God goes, I can handle all of it. And God today just wants to simply come and change you from the inside out. You don't have to know every question in order to walk with God. You just have to know that there's a God that wants to walk with you today. And he wants to walk with you today. He wants to walk with you in relationship. And if you want to walk hand in hand with God, God calls that new relationship being born again. That's what that's called.
For those that are believers, for those that are born again here, this is your moment to pray. This is your moment that people would begin to understand that there are people here that have been able to walk through and by memory to go, God has been faithful. And there's some that are sitting here and some that are watching that have never known all that God has been doing for you to get you to this point right now. And this is such a critical point because I want you to hear this. God just doesn't want to walk you through life. He wants to walk you through life all the way into eternity. That's what he wants to do. This is not a God just for the time that you're alive. This is a God that walks you right into forever. That's what he's come to do. And today that can happen. Today that can happen. That new relationship that Jesus talks about, he talks about it being a second birth. In fact, the phrase that Jesus uses that he's calling all of us to live by, he calls the phrase being born again. He said, if you want to walk hand in hand with me through life and into forever, Jesus said, no man can see the kingdom of heaven. That's forever, unless they're born again. Jesus said, just that new relationship can happen right here. It can happen right now. It can happen to anyone that's in this place right now. Those that are watching online, you don't have to be in this building. You can, you can respond right now. How, Pastor Tim, how do I do that? How do I get this new relationship with God? Jesus uses this term, born again. Let me tell you why that's significant. He was, he was saying, just as all of us have had a first birth physically, many in a hospital, said the second birth is something that's done spiritually. This is where God comes and lives inside of us. This is where God changes us from the inside out. It doesn't mean every question is answered. It doesn't mean every problem is solved. But I'm telling you this, but you have God that walks with you now. You have a God that walks hand in hand. That means in the worst of nights, when you hear those sounds, when, when the past seems to come, when daylight comes, there's joy in the morning. You can look right across, and he's been there the whole time. The whole time. Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? How do I have that kind of relationship with God? I thought, what well, if I come to church, I could do this. I thought, I thought being here in the building for, for, for this time that I have a relationship with God or because I have a label on me, because I'm a Muslim or because I'm a... Baptist or because I'm a Jew or because I'm a Methodist or a Catholic that I've got this relation with God. Those are labels. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said this is a new relationship. It's called being born again. It's where God is birthed. It's not you being in here. It's God getting inside of you. That's the new relationship. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? Well, let's, let's break it down to this simplicity. It's A, B, and C. Those three, three, three letters we always say is elementary school. Those three letters correspond to three different words. A, admitting. This is how God begins to get birthed inside of us. A, it's admitting that I'm a sinner. It's when I get honest with God that all of us have a condition that keeps us from God, and the condition is called sin. I can't fix that distance between me and God. There's not a promise I can make. There's not a program I can go to. There's not a priest that can fix it, a pastor, a church, a religion. None of us. We need help to fix this. We're all broken on the inside. I'm broken on the inside. The diagnosis is sin, and it simply calls for admission that I'm a sinner, admitting that I'm a sinner, not mistakers in need of correction, Sinners in need of a savior. I don't need a second chance. I need a second birth. Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? That's the B word. Believe. Believe that God sent his son to fix what I couldn't fix on my, my own. If we could fix ourselves, think about this. And God putting his son through the suffering that he went through on the cross wouldn't even make sense. If, if God sent his son to die on the cross, go through that suffering, and then says to everyone in this room, everyone that's online, hey, you gotta be good to get to heaven. You gotta do this. You gotta be a good person. You can't hurt anybody. You can't kill anybody. You gotta get water baptized and eat communion and do all this. Those are all great things, but that's not what Jesus said. It's by believing that God sent his son, think about this, to become my sin bearer, to pay the penalty for my sin. I couldn't pay. That's the song you sang, that last song that Emily led us in, about the blood being applied, him dying the death I should have died, living the life I couldn't live, 
giving me a reward, giving you a reward, heaven and forgiveness that none of us deserved. And finally, confessing Jesus as Lord. That's a big thing. Confess as Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Pastor Tim, what does that mean? That word Lord is what changes it from a religion to a relationship. When Jesus is Lord, he is not interested in just meeting with you 90 minutes every single Sunday. When Jesus is Lord, he will walk with you every single day of your life. Jesus did not come to get you to sit in a chair on Sundays. Jesus came, he wants to walk with you every day of your life. Jesus didn't raise from the dead so he can just get your attention on Sundays. He wants to talk to you on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. That's why coming Christianity is not coming to a place. Christianity is coming to a person, and that person is Jesus. Today, that can happen to you, whether you're online or in person. I want everyone, for these next few minutes, most important thing that can happen here today, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head just for a moment here today. We're going to sing one more song. We're going to rejoice today. We're going to thank God for what he's done today. But some of you are sitting here today with the groan and the growl. Some of you have come to conclusions about God, but something today, come to conclusions about God that aren't right, but something today says, wait, no, no. God is real. God loves you. He's been there sitting by that tree all night long in the darkest of night. He's there. He's there for you. He's there for you. And that's why today, this is going to be such an important moment. Those that are watching from Barcelona or the Philippines, those in Finland and France and Belgium, and those right here in 51st and Broadway, this is a moment that literally is life-changing. It's the most important question. Have you been born again? That's the relationship of hand in hand, God walking through, even when the goggles are filled, the flaming arrows have hit. The questions are multiplying. The conclusions are faulty, but you end up remembering God is with me. God is here. God loves me. That God would speak to you in your biggest doubting season like John the Baptist and say, and say to you, think of this for just a moment. At John's lowest point, Jesus spoke the greatest thing to him. At your lowest point today, he is speaking to your hearts all over this place, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. That's the God that I want with me, hand in hand. Not church, not a religion, not a denomination. Let me just be real clear. There's not a mosque, a synagogue, or a church or a cathedral that can fix your life. Only Jesus can fix your life today. And I'm telling you, there's nothing special about this building but there's something hugely magnificent about Jesus today. And he loves you. And if you're sitting here today, I don't care whether you're a student at Fordham or at NYU. I don't care if you make a whole boatload of money down on Wall Street. I don't care what sports team you play for, and I don't care what theater you act in. I don't care if you're an ambassador at the UN or you live in the projects in Brooklyn. Let me just tell you, we all need Jesus. And that can happen today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we still have protocol for some COVID, for some COVID parts that, that we're going to be lessening up in, in, the, in the weeks and months to come. But if you're here today, I just say, Pastor Tim, I want to start a journey with God today. I want to be born again. Because I'm going to pray a born again prayer. And if, when I pray this prayer, we're all praying together. But if you say, Pastor Tim, I want that. I want to be born again today. Balcony, main floor, online. We're going to challenge you. And you go, when you pray that prayer, would you put me in that prayer? And if that's you, I'm not going to make you stand. And right now, I'm not even going to make you walk forward. But I am going to ask you to do this with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you want to make a decision and go, I come to God, my lowest point, my questions, my flaming question, my multiplication of questions. I'm coming to God with my goggles filled with water. But today, I want to I want to be part of that prayer. I want to start a journey with God today. I want to be born again. Pastor Tim, when you pray that prayer, would you put me in there without any hesitation? If that's you, balcony, main floor, I want you to raise your hand right now. Say, put me in that prayer. Hold it. Hold your hands up high because I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. Hold it up as high as you can because I want to make sure I count and see every hand. There's one, two, 
three, keep them up, four, keep them up, I wanna see five, six, got you in the back, seven, eight, I wanna make sure I see every hand, eight, nine, thank God, 10, 11, 12, balcony, 13, all the way in the back, thank you, 14, keep them up, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, anybody else? I just wanna make sure I don't miss anybody else. Got you over 23, 24, thank God for every single one of you. You can put your hands down, got you over there. 24, thank you so much. Those online, if you are wanting to make that decision, just, just type in, decide it, right on that text line. Come on, can we all pray this together with every one of, all of us say these words together. Come on, let's say this together. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe You're the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Now, we like to say this part loud. Come on, folks. Say this with me. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. Come on. Can we put our hands together and thank God?